archaeologists have encountered a real ancient curse, a mysterious treasure cave, the story of an amazing turtle boy, a liquor store in the Roman Empire, chewing gum which is about 12,000 years old, and how graves were protected from looters in ancient times. A pot of burnt porridge and the grave of relatives of Alexander the Great. You will learn about all this and more in this video. Hi friend, you're on the Kurtop channel. Pot of Burnt Porridge In one of the oldest villages in Germany, in Oldenburg, LA7, archaeologists discovered a unique treasure – fragments of an ancient pen. This find tells us about the culinary preferences of our ancestors more than 5,000 years ago. They also cooked porridge. Lucy Kubiak Martens, a renowned archaeobotanist, shared some impressive details. Chemical analysis of the shards showed traces of grains such as spelt and barley, as well as protein Mari seeds similar to quinoa. Interestingly, sprouted grains were found, which indicates ignorance of ancient methods of grain drying. This is the first time traces of cooked food have been found on pottery in Neolithic Germany. Jade Mask Archaeologists have made an important discovery in the dense rainforest of Guatemala, in a place called Chakitim. They discovered a woven jade mask believed to have belonged to an unknown Mayan king who lived about 1,700 years ago. This find may shed light on Mayan religious devotion and royal succession during the early classic period. It also supports the hypothesis that members of the Mayan royal families may have been enslaved by more powerful Mesoamerican dynasties. In addition to the the mask, archaeologists found a skull, teeth, a skull-shaped stone box, and numerous offerings at Chakitim, including shells, bones, and shiny pieces of jade. Alexander Tokovining, an expert in Mayan epigraphy, helped decipher the glyphs on the bones and identified the human remains as the Itzam ruler Kokai Balam. And the deity depicted on the mask turned out to be Yaxwayab Chak, he is the incarnation of the Mayan god of storms ancient sword in the river. A medieval sword was recently discovered in the depth of a Polish river, which experts say may have links to the Vikings. This sword is decorated with a mysterious inscription and is one of eight similar artifacts found in Poland. The discovery was made during deep-sea exploration in the port of Lochlevek, near Torin, a UNESCO-protected city. The sword, which had survived centuries of corrosion, was dated to the 10th century AD. This period is extremely significant for the history of Poland, linking the beginning of the formation of the state with the Pius dynasty. The sword could have witnessed the birth of the Polish nation. Historically, swords of this type are associated with northwestern Europe, suggesting Scandinavian or Frankish origin. However, the exact roots and connection to the Vikings remain a matter of debate among historians. Of particular interest is the inscription Ulfberth, found on the layers of corrosion, which may indicate the name Ulfberth. This name appears on swords found in northern Europe dating from the 9th to 11 centuries, adding to the mystery of the source history. Treasures of Ghana Two leading British museums have agreed with the Ghanaian government to return gold artifacts stolen in the 19th century. Last May, the Asantine, King of Ghana, met in London with the directors of the British Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum. He was decided to transfer 32 gold exhibits taken by the British 150 years ago to Ghana for three years. In 1874, the British plundered the royal palace in Ghana. In 1896, another military operation took place, leading to further robberies. The museum's joint statement acknowledged that the seized items have cultural and historical significance to the the Asante people and are linked to British colonial history. Items being returned included a golden peace pipe purchased at auction for £85, as well as rings, scabbards, soul discs, knives and necklaces. The British feared that this agreement could become a precedent for the return of other items captured during the colonial wars. Personally, I am very glad that finally, valuable exhibits from museums are gradually beginning to return to their homeland. Treasure Cave 
Archaeologists from the National Institute of Anthropology and History of Mexico discovered ancient hunting tools in the Cueva del Tesoro Cave, located in the state of Querétaro. The cave was named Treasure Cave for the huge number of ancient artifacts. Speleologists exploring this cave discovered a hidden cavity where archaeologists found ancient hunting tools, including an atlatl and wooden darts. The atlatl, an ancient javelin thrower, was used in Mesoamerica and other regions of the world. This device increased the range and accuracy of throwing darts, as well as the speed and destructive power of the spear. In addition to the atlatl, processed slugs were found in the cavity, which may have served as multifunctional tools. Preliminary dating of the artifacts indicates that they belong to the 1st century AD, meaning that they were hidden in a niche approximately 1,900 years ago. Rare Coin in Jerusalem Israeli archaeologists during excavations near Jerusalem discovered a unique artifact, part of an ancient silver coin, the age of which is estimated at two and a half thousand years. This find represents one of only six coins of this type found in Israel. The coin belongs to a group of very early coins minted in the 6th-5th centuries BC outside Israel in ancient Greece, Cyprus, and Turkey. This artifact was created in an era when coins were just beginning to be used, and its discovery provides important information about the transition from the weighing of silver to the use of coins as a means of payment. The coin discovered was deliberately cut in two, indicating that it was used as a weighed piece of silver in the 4th century. BC, although coins were already in circulation at that time. One side of the coin shows a pattern made with a square die. This suggests that coins with raised images appeared later thanks to the development of more complex minting technologies. Victim of the Curse of Pompeii an unusual phenomenon is happening in the Pompeii Archaeological Park. Tourists are returning stolen artifacts and asking for forgiveness, believing that a curse has fallen on them after the theft. One of the last letters received by Gabriel Zachtriegel, the director of the park, aroused great interest. The woman in the letter apologized for taking the stones from Pompeii and talked about her illness, breast cancer, which she was diagnosed with a year after the visit. She admitted that she did not know about the curse and asked to return the stones to their historical place. Suck Trigel published a photo of the latter on social networks, noting that the stones had returned home and wished the sender good luck. He stressed that the theft of artifacts is a crime that the park is required to report to authorities. According to Suck Trigel, hundreds of similar letters with apologies and stories about the curse are being received. Many claim that, up to the theft of artifacts from Pompeii, misfortunes befell them, illnesses and financial difficulties. In 2020, a Canadian woman returned mosaic tiles, an amphora, and a fragment of ceramics that she had stolen 15 years ago. In the latter, she spoke about two cases of breast cancer and financial problems. Nicole explained that she wanted to own a unique piece of history, but now believes that the artifacts contain negative energy. What do you think it was? Did these artifacts really have the magical power of a curse, or was it karma that overtook the plunderers of antiquity? Write your opinion in the comments under the video. Ice Age Burial Archaeologists in Brazil have uncovered the mystery of an ancient cemetery in the city of São Luís, Marinhau State, where the remains of about 43 people and over 100,000 fragments of artifacts dating back about 10,000 years were found. The burial spanned four different historical periods. The remains of people, mostly small adult men, were excavated at varying depth from 60 centimeters to 2 meters. Marks on the bones indicate hard physical work and an active lifestyle. Willing Milton Lage, director of the excavation, suggests that the discovered skeletons belong to an unknown community of hunter-gatherers, ancient coastal inhabitants who depended on sea resources and built shell mounds. The São Luís region, known as the Big Island among indigenous people, contains traces of prehistoric human activity as confirmed by the discovery of a 6,000-year-old fossilized jaw dating back to the 1970s. Tomb of Relatives of Alexander the Great Virginia, a small Greek town with a population of about 1,500 people, became famous thanks to its archaeological finds. In 1977, royal tombs associated with relatives of Alexander the Great were discovered here. One of the tombs was long believed to belong to Philip II of Macedon, the father of the famous conqueror, but the exact identification remained a mystery. The first explorations in Virginia began in 1861 by the French explorer Leon Easy, but the key discoveries were 
were made by Manolis Andronicus in 1977, when the royal tombs were found. Based on recent research, scientists claim that Philip II of Macedon is buried in one of the tombs alone with his wife Cleopatra and their newborn child. This is confirmed by the knee injury of the skeleton and is consistent with the historical record of the death of Philip II. The second tomb, according to researchers, contains the remains of Eurydice and her husband Philip III Archidaeus, half-brother of Alexander the Great. These findings are based on the absence of leg trauma and evidence of frequent horse riding in the female skeleton. The third tomb, as expected, belongs to Alexander IV, the son of Alexander the Great and Roxana. This is confirmed by the long-standing knowledge of scientists and the lack of grounds for new assumptions. These discoveries at Virginia enrich knowledge of the history of Macedonia and its famous rulers, revealing new details about the lives and death of these historical figures. Turtle Boy and His Story George Williams, known as Turtle Boy, was born in 1859 in Arkansas with paratraumatic dysplasia, a rare type of dwarfism. His height was only 45 centimeters, and his body was characterized by curved bones, giving him an unusual appearance. At the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, Williams gained popularity performing at fairs and museums, especially the Hoover Museum in New York. Despite the fact that in appearance he did not resemble a turtle, his image was often complimented by by a shell on posters and in advertising. Williams was not limited to the role of an exhibit, he actively performed, demonstrating his talents. He played the harmonica and flute, and also had a pleasant baritone voice. Williams' special hobby was billiards, where he showed himself to be a true master. At the peak of his career, George earned $75 a week, less than many of his colleagues, perhaps due to the racial prejudice of the time. Nevertheless, Williams led a full and apparently happy life. He became the owner of a farm in Illinois. In 1920, following a wheelchair incident in New York, Williams made the news by suing the city which he lost. This was the last mention of him in the media, and the details of his subsequent life and death remain unknown. Roman Legionnaire's Shield the shield, found in the collapsed tower of Dura Europa's fortress, is surprising in its preservation. The colors remain bright and the dimensions are 105.5 cm in height, 41 cm in width, and 30 cm in depth due to its semi-cylindrical shape. Made of wooden planks 1.5 2 mm thick and 30-80 mm wide, made laid in three layers. The shield is covered with leather, and its weight with the ambon, a metal hemispherical plate in the middle, is about 8 kg. On the top of the shield, there is a Roman eagle. On the sides, winged female figures with wraths of winners, and below, a lion causing tenderness with its appearance. The shield was discovered at Dura Europus, a city captured by the Persians in 256 AD. It is assumed that the Romans removed the ambo and transferred it to another shield, since the scutum, the rectangular shield of the legionnaire, was hardly suitable for fortress walls. All other shields found there are oval in shape. Unfortunately, there is no photograph of the back of the shield, but there is only a newly made base from restorers. When found, the shield was damaged and divided into parts. Restorers recreated it, but had to make it more curved than it was originally. The ambon is a metal plate on the shield that protects the warrior's hand. And Ecos of an Ancient Battle in Andalusia, archaeologists have discovered a unique artifact associated with Julius Caesar and the ancient Abera Roman city of Ipska. The find is a lead slang bowl on which the name of Caesar and the name of Ipski are abbreviated. This is the first time in the Iberian Peninsula that such a clear inscription of the name of Caesar and the name of Roman city from Spain has been found on such a shell. The discovery was made thanks to the work of experts from various research institutions in Spain. The bowl was found in the Montilla region in Andalusia, where, according to historians, the famous Battle of Munda could have taken place in 45 BC, where Caesar encountered the sons of Pompey. The bowl itself is shaped like an acorn with pointed ends, measures 4.5 cm in length, 2 cm in width, and 1.5 cm in height, and weighs about 71 grams. It has IBSCA and CAES clearly engraved on it. This artifact is an example of the ancient Greek and Roman practice of inscribing metal slings projectiles known as glandis inscripti. To create these projectiles, clay molds with notches were used, which made it possible to obtain relief inscriptions. These inscriptions usually contain the name of the manufacturer, military legions, or locations. The oldest human site in China 
archaeologists have established that ancient people inhabited the territory of the current Angari district in the Zizan Autonomous Region more than 50,000 years ago. Research at this location continued for about six years. In July 2018, archaeologists discovered the remains of Paleolithic settlements on a mountain south of Gagai County in Angari County, on the left bank of the Shikanhei River. Located at an altitude of 4.7 kilometers above sea level, those settlements are among the highest known to scientists. Jean Sealing, a senior researcher at the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, said that the Milan Tafak archaeological complex consists of three caves, the largest of which exceeds 1,000 square meters. In two of these caves, over 10,000 artifacts of stone and bronze age, including stone, bones, ceramic and bronze objects, as well as plants, remains. In one of the caves, rock paintings made in ochre were discovered, depicting figures of people and the sun with vertical lines. Preliminary data obtained by photoluminescent spectroscopy and radiocarbon dating indicated the first traces of human activity in one of the caves may date to 53 or even 80,000 years ago. Ritual Axe 4,500 years old in China, in the city of Wuxi, archaeologists have discovered an ancient ritual weapon, an engraved axe that is four and a half thousand years old. The axe belongs to the Lianzhu culture, one of the most developed cultures in China at that time. This culture lived in the Yangtze River Delta, but when the floods occurred, the people of Lianzhu were forced to leave their capital and settlements. This led to their complete extinction around 2300 BC. This led to their complete extinction around 2300 BC. Scientists have found 329 stone tools, 73 stone and bone arrows, and many other ceramic and jade artifacts. The most interesting is the axe, on which images of tigers, patterns of clouds and birds are engraved on both sides. The axe was found on a sacrificial platform and shows signs of wear and damage. Scientists believe that the axe was not used in battles, but in rituals and ceremonies to symbolize power. Liu Baoshan, head of the local archaeological institute, said the patterns on the axe were made with a harder stone tool. This is the first tiger in engraved axe found in the region. Now we will dive into history even deeper and find out what our ancestors ate more than 100,000 years ago. Wine Shop from the Roman Empire in Greece, archaeologists have unearthed an ancient wine shop, 1,600 years old, left without owners after the disaster. The discovery was made in Sikion, in the south of the country, on the territory of the former Roman Empire. The study, presented at a conference of the Archaeological Institute of America in Chicago, uncovered fragments of pottery and 60 coins dating to the period between 337 and 361 AD. The store was located in a complex that also housed workshops for pressing grapes and olives. Although it is impossible to accurately establish the range of wine sold due to lack of data, it is assumed that olive oil was also traded here. The remains of marble tabletops and vessels made of various materials were found in the room. Researchers speculate that the store was destroyed due to unforeseen circumstances such as an earthquake. The coins scattered around the room indicate the suddenness of the incident, as a result of which the container with the money was destroyed. The exact cause of the destruction remains open, but the subsequent abandonment of the store and surrounding complex dates back to the early 5th century AD. Anglo-Saxon Cemetery an amazing discovery was recently made in the UK during the construction site of the Viking Link, another sea energy cable between the UK and Denmark. Archaeologists from Wessex have stumbled upon an Anglo-Saxon cemetery dating back to the 6th and 7th centuries AD, shedding light on the mysterious period of British history. Traces of a Bronze Age rain ditch and 23 barrels with rich grave goods were discovered here. Knives, jewelry, ceramic vessels, as well as the grave of a teenage girl with gold pendants decorated with garnets, a brooch, glass beads, and a silver pendant with amber. This period remains mysterious due to the lack of historical sources. Therefore, every find from this time is incredibly valuable for understanding history. The researchers plan to conduct isotope and DNA analysis of the skeletons to establish family connections between those buried and to understand the lifestyle and diet of those times. It is expected that these analyses will help uncover many unknown pages of history. How were graves protected from looting? 
In the history of mankind, there have always been cases of violation of the peace of the dead, especially in relation to ancient graves. Often, valuables from the crypts ended up in private collections, since the dead were often buried with family jewelry. Vandalism was common in the cemeteries of medieval Europe, and wealthy families protected their graves with metal bars which later became known as mort safes. These devices appeared in England in the 18th century. Ironically, cemeteries suffered especially during the Enlightenment. Until the 18th century, pathological anatomy was prohibited. In 1832, the English Parliament allowed the purchase of bodies for research, but before that, illegal and profitable business had already flourished, including the desecration of graves. The church reacted negatively to the exhumation, preaching sermons about the torment of those whose bodies were desecrated. People looked for ways to protect graves, hired guards, observation towers, concrete coffins and moored safes. But such measures were available only to the rich. Poor people used stones, layers of turf, and even planted plants to protect the graves of their loved ones. In 1781, metal coffins appeared in England, but only wealthy citizens could afford them due to their high cost and weight. There were three types of moored safes – high fences, cages with iron pins and heavy boulders, as well as moored towers, high crypts with several niches for family members and numerous locks. These protections reflect troubling times when, even in death, the peace of the deceased was threatened by the desire of others to possess a piece of their history or wealth. With colored masks and golden tongues. In the historical area of Al Banasa in Egypt, a team of Spanish archaeologists led by Dr. Meiti Mascora and Dr. Astor Posmelato from the University of Barcelona made a significant discovery. Scientists have discovered ancient rock cut tombs, as well as a number of valuable artifacts, allowing for a more in depth study of the history of this region. A team of archaeologists has found tombs that date back to the Ptolemaic and Roman eras, revealing a unique burial method. One of the most amazing finds are terracotta statues of Isis Aphrodite, decorated with crowns of leaves, which are an important addition to the study of the art of that era. The excavations also uncovered Roman-era mummies adorned with gilded and colored funerary masks. An interesting feature was the discovery of golden tongs in the mouths of some mummies, which indicates ancient burial customs designed to keep the deceased capable of conversation in the afterlife. Adala Kassa, head of the Central Authority of Antiquities of Middle Egypt, stressed the importance of finding a ruined building with unique designs depicting plants, vines, and animals. These images provide valuable insight into the culture and life in Albanus in ancient times. 10,000-year-old chewing gum 10,000 years ago, in what is now Sweden, a group of teenagers chewed birch tar, similar to children chewing gum today. They could not even imagine that in the future, scientists would analyze their chewing remains and find out many interesting facts about their diet, lifestyle, and even health. Three pieces of birch pitch, used as glue in the Stone Age, were found in the 1990s at the site called Hizabi Clav. Microbial DNA analysis of the resin showed high levels of bacteria associated with gum disease such as Treponema denticola and Streptococcus anginosus. The study of these samples showed that the ancient teenagers suffered from curious and periodontal disease and also ate deer, trout, hazelnuts, and processed fox and wolf fur. Scientists have also found traces of birds and other animals, indicating their use as food and the processing of bones into tools. Traces of mistletoe were found in the gums of the specimens, suggesting the plant's possible use in medicine or as a poison for arrowheads. The discovery provides a unique insight into the lives of hunter-gatherers on the west coast of Scandinavia 9,700 years ago, allowing us to learn about their diet and dental problems. And we are only talking about very old chewing gum that children chewed, and thanks to modern technologies, they can already tell so much about the lifestyle of people who lived 12,000 years ago. How did the first paper money appear? Long ago, during the time of the ancient Phoenicians, trading was a difficult business. To facilitate the exchange of goods, they came up with the idea of using coins as a universal medium of exchange. However, the coins were heavy and the slaves carried them using special handles. Then the Chinese came on the scene with a revolutionary idea. Around the 1st century BC, they came up with leather banknotes. They were made from the skin of white deer and marked with special marks. They could be used for purchases anywhere in the empire, and refusing to accept them cost a life. 
This leather money became the progenitors of paper bills that we know today. Around the 800s, the Chinese decided to try to create paper money using the woodcut technique, which is a method of engraving wood and imprinting on paper. But this flying money, as they were nicknamed, was not immediately taken seriously. After all, a paper bill could easily fly away with a breath of wind. Initially, these paper money were used as guarantees for debt obligations, but over time, they have become a full-fledged means of payment. Paper money made trading much more convenient. Merchants no longer had to carry heavy coins and the metal could be used for other important uses. This new flying money was more like checks and was used for large transactions. In just a few decades, paper money has evolved from a credit certificate to a full-fledged means of payment, becoming what we call paper money today. Europe at that time was still immersed in the Middle Ages, but the idea of the Chinese was so breakthrough that it spread all over the world. And so, in 1601, Sweden became the first European country to print and put into circulation paper money. Thus began the history of paper money, which we know and use today. Earliest Depiction of a Kiss Are you ready to dive into the world of a real archaeological detective story? Today we have a special episode about the oldest kiss in the history of mankind. Yes, you're not mistaken, we are going on a journey to the origins of Romans and perhaps even herpes. Do you know where the first kiss in history originated? Researchers from the University of Copenhagen found traces of it in Mesopotamia, in the ancient Near East, and that was about four and a half thousand years ago. Scientists say that people were already practicing kissing back then, and this may even have contributed to the spread of herpes. It sounds a little scary, but it proves that kissing has been an important part of our lives for thousands of years across cultures and religions. Imagine, guys, in ancient Mesopotamia, people used clay tablets for writing and some of them described kissing as part of romantic intimacy and friendship. And even our closest relatives, bonobos and chimpanzees, also kiss. Here's your proof that kissing is not just our whim, but the basis of our communication and relationships. That's just interesting. Could the herpes simplex virus be transmitted through these very early kisses? Ancient Mesopotamian medical texts mention a disease that resembles herpes in symptoms. Of course, we can be 100% sure it's herpes, but the resemblance is amazing. It turns out that both Romans and disease connect us with ancient people much more than we could imagine. Royal Dwarf Joseph Borulaski The story of Joseph Borulaski is a vivid example of how short stature did not become an obstacle to an impressive and successful life. Born in 1739 in the Chalice region, Joseph was one of six children in the family, where except for himself and one of his brothers, everyone was above average height. While the aristocracy and royalty sought to have court dwarfs for entertainment, Joseph found his path to success through unique circumstances. After the death of his father, his fate changed radically when he was taken under the guardianship of the wealthy noblewoman Starina de Carles, thanks to which the boy received an excellent education and mastered the manners of high society. Borolaski traveled with Countess Gumitska with his new patron, visited noble courts, received a diamond ring from Empress Maria Theresa and a lifelong pension from Prince Kaunitz. He was hospitably received by King Stanislaus of Poland and the Duke d'Orleans in Paris. Failure in love did not break Joseph, and he eventually found happiness in his marriage to Isolina Bor with whom he had children of normal height. The family settled in Great Britain, where Joseph performed in public. He had a well-proportioned build, more like a child than a grown man. Surprisingly, his height continued to increase until he was 30 years old. Joseph Borlaski, the last court dwarf of Europe, died in 1837 at the age of 98 in Durham, proving that short stature is not a barrier to achieving success, fame, wealth, and family happiness. Read this video with a thumbs up or thumbs down and write a kind comment. Thanks for your views. Bye, everyone!